Welcome everybody to our final research seminar of the semester and it is an absolute delight to have with us today uh, Professor Martin Haspelmatt who is of course extremely well known in our field in linguistics and uh, we were planning to get Martin here um, in person and it was looking really good too. We had a flight booked and all the forms filled out and the hotel sorted but then the uh, pandemic took a turn for the worse again. And uh, unfortunately, it is now impossible uh, for him to actually be here in person. But fortunately for us, uh, Martin has agreed to deliver his uh, talk online on Zoom, which is very, very kind. Thank you. I'm very grateful. And I'm looking forward to this talk very much. And with this, I give the word to Eva, um, who will introduce the speaker to us uh, today. So, Eva, please. Yeah, I'd like to join Richard in uh, expressing my um, sincere welcome to Martin. And um, we are really sorry to not have you here in person, but um, it's great that at least we will be able to hear your talk. Um, Martin Haspelmatt is a researcher at the Science of Human History in Jena, Germany. Um, really, he doesn't need much of, a, of an introduction and uh, even just reading out his publication list would take the next hour. So I will refrain from doing that. But I'll say a few words. Um, I had the great pleasure to spend a short time in the same research group at the, as Martin about 20 years ago in the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, where he was working before the um, one for science of human history. And yeah, as you know, Martin is an extremely prolific researcher in the field of typology and um, with the particular focus on functional explanations of language structures, which we will also hear about today. But what I find really impressive in his work is that he always shows an awareness um, of and um, so sort of works out the relevance to other approaches as well. So the relevance goes far beyond um, what people would call functional typological approach. His work ranges from uh, grammar of uh, the language Lesgian, which is still extremely well regarded in the field from 1993, to a lot of publications on the typology of various individual phenomena uh, ranging from indefinite pronouns to ditransitive constructions, serial verbs, nominal plurality, temporal adverbials, reflexives, and the topic of today's talk, case marking. You sort of get the idea. It's, um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm tempted to say um, Martin is a jack of all trade, but in this case, actually a master of all. Um, He's also uh, made very um, interesting contributions to the um, concepts of semantic maps, grammaticalization, and morphology, among others. I recently looking at his publication list, I saw a 2020 paper in the journal Morphology on the concept of more. And also far from sitting in an ivory tower, apart from all this research, and for me almost unimaginably, Martin has found time for a lot of collaborative and editorial work, um, the best known of which are the World Atlas of Language Structures and also the Atlas of Pigeon and Creole Structures. And he's also been, and, and I really like to mention this, a tireless champion for open access in linguistics and one of the directors of Language Science Press, which is really doing a great service to the field. I'm pleased that today's talk on method and theory and comparative grammar relates to the research agenda that is probably my favorite amongst his work, and that's the um, explanation of universal tendencies of grammatical structure in terms of frequency of usage. Um, I see that some uh, people are actually here who were students in my typology class, so you will have heard of um, his classic paper against marketness and also about um, so frequency versus iconicity in explaining grammatical asymmetries, which we apply to possessive constructions. Um, this frequency based explanation um, research, he's uh, 
recently extended to case marking split as part of a recent ERC project, which is officially entitled Form Frequency Correspondences in Grammar, but on his website actually says usage-based explanations of universal coding asymmetries in grammar. And I'm really looking forward to hearing more about this in your talk. So the floor is all yours, Martin. Thank you so much, Eva, for this uh, very rich, uh, generous, um, very formal <laughs> introduction. Um, we've known each other for a very long time, so um, yeah, thanks. Anyway, I'm, uh, I want to make it a bit uh, less formal. <laughs> I, I hope I, I know quite a few of the people in the audience, that's really nice. As I mentioned earlier, I gave this talk to an audience in China and I knew nobody there and that was kind of really uh, difficult in the Zoom mode. And uh, so now it's a bit, it's a bit easier for me. So um, uh, I hope that you can see my screen now. And my talk is uh, about method and theory in comparative grammar. Uh, where I contrast measurement uniformity and building block uniformity. Uh, <clears throat> so the first approach, uh, based on measurement uniformity and a clear separation between an autonomous comparative method and explanatory theories. The other approach is based on the idea that languages are made from the same building blocks, so that the explanatory theory, that is the hypothesized uniform building blocks, is not autonomous from the method for comparison. So by giving these references to Dreyer and Haspelmatt on the one hand and Huang, Roberts, Holmberg on the other, uh, most of you will already uh, sort of recognize that this, you know, kind of Greenbergian functionalist approach versus the kind of Chomsky and generative approach. But I'm, I'm using these new labels in order to shed new light on uh, what um, really distinguishes the approaches. I think that measurement versus building block uh, approaches can also be found in other sciences. So in comparative biology, comparison is autonomous from explanation. So, you know, we look at plants and animals and compare them. Um, and then the explanation is adaptation on the one hand and common descent on the other hand, but they're quite independent uh, of the comparative uh, methods. In comparative chemistry, by contrast, comparison crucially involves uniform building blocks. You really need the periodic table of elements in order to do comparative chemistry. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, first um, I say a bit more about measurement uniformity, and then in section three about building block uniformity. So I'm very interested, as Ifa already said, in uh, language universals, Greenbergian universals, and in testing them. Now to compare languages, we need uniform yardsticks for comparison. So if we have a Greenbergian universal, uh, such as one, if the adnominal possessor precedes the noun, the object tends to precede the verb. If the adnominal possessor follows the noun, the object tends to follow the verb. Then we need to determine the order of ad possessor and noun in a representative set of the world's languages. So we have to look at lots of languages and compare languages. But how do we measure or determine? And I'm using this term measure to, uh, to get this effect of looking at things in a new way. Uh, you know, when you actually look at Dreyer 2005, uh, you know, he has this notion of a dominant order and he measures in the literal sense. He says, when more than six to 7% of the occurrences in texts uh, are of a particular order, then that counts as a dominant order. So in German, the order of genitive and noun is noun followed by genitive because preposed genitives, they do occur in German, but not more than 33% of the time. So they're kind of a minor pattern, right? Whereas in English, it's kind of really more equal. So English has no dominant order, German has a dominant order, but it's not rigid. How do we measure, how do we determine what's a possessor, what's a noun, what's an object, what's a verb? Now, Greenberg 63 said very clearly, <clears throat> we determine that semantically. So noun, <clears throat> object, and verb are not universal syntactic notions. 
but really verb means an action word, object means a patient <clears throat> word, and so on. So comparison in this approach is not based on the rules of the languages. Rules do not make reference to text frequencies, and <clears throat> they don't necessarily make uh, reference to semantic notions. So I think another field where it's very clear is economics. We measure economic indicators like inflation by uniform yardstick. And we ignore culture spe specific rules about money or buying, let alone mental representations of money, right? So I think that what we're doing <clears throat> in the Greenbergian approach is really more a kind of cultural uh, comparison, uh, kind of comparative anthropology like comparative economics, which is also in a way a branch of comparative anthropology. Also, when we compare phonological systems, we do that by means of phonetic properties, not the phonological rules or phonological values. So in general, cross-cultural, cross-linguistic comparison requires comparative concepts, not the descriptive categories that we use for describing the rules of culture-specific systems. <clears throat> the advantage of this measurement uniformity approach is that it allows large-scale quantitative testing of universals. So something like the World Atlas of Language Structures is possible on this approach, whereas uh, it's more difficult on the other approach, as we will see now. So the other approach, what I call building block uniformity, <clears throat> often people say, that one needs to have deeper non-surface descriptions as a basis for comparison. <clears throat> so Bob Alik in a recent interview uh, said that one of the hurdles to seeing more fruitful interaction between typological studies, formal genitive approaches lies in the granularity of the questions being asked, the degree to which you're ready to look beyond the surface descriptions, to ask questions about patterns, to high level of, of abstraction. So he thinks that it has to do with abstraction. Holberg 2016, Similar, the more abstract the properties, uh, the more uh, this building block uniformity approach is successful. Roberts similarly says, from the perspective of generative grammar, much typological analysis is excessively surface oriented. Now, the idea here is that the right typological generalizations must be found at the level of abstract analyses, the rules of the languages. <clears throat> abstract analyses of the sort typically offered by generativists. So in terms of transformations, x schema, and other abstract elements. Now, of course, abstractness um, <clears throat> is a feature of all science. And, you know, all sciences want to sort of get at the really deep um, features of their um, phenomena. But here, this really means analysis in terms of innate categories. So what's of interest to the generative approach is uniformity of building blocks. And this is ensured by assuming that the building blocks are innate. And I have a recent paper discussing uh, the, the idea that the innateness claim might be dropped, but then I think it becomes incoherent. Uh, <clears throat> but we do not know what the building blocks are. This is a practical problem. Th these building blocks are subject to constant re-evaluation. Uh, in the generative approach, this is sort of, well, this is normal science, we kind of constantly re-evaluate. Well, yes, sure. But if each new language may lead a research to make a new proposal about the innate building blocks, then it means that large-scale quantitative testing <clears throat> of universals is not really possible. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> this, uh, by way of uh, first introduction, uh, to these two approaches. I will uh, come back to them um, in section five, but uh, next I will uh, give you an overview of um, um, some of the claims that I have made about argument coding splits, uh, such as object marking in a recent paper that appeared in linguistics uh, earlier this year. So four of the most famous argument coding splits are differential object marking, dative alternations, person split ergativity, and the person case constraint. So um, dative alternations are well known even uh, to people who only know English. 
uh, differential object marking is very well known to anyone who knows about romance linguistics. The person case constraint is also very widespread in languages with uh, object clitics, mainly South Slavic and uh, romance languages. And person split ergativity is a bit more exotic, but for for if I should say that, I wanted to include that. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so I, I claim that uh, these uh, splits, the, the coding split universals, are all special instances of the universal that I call the role reference association universal, which says that deviations from usual associations of role rank and referential prominence tend to be coded by longer grammatical forms if the coding is asymmetric. Now, this is very abstract. You see, as I said, you know, all deep science, you know, chooses abstract concepts. Uh, <clears throat> but um, I, I'll try to make it more concrete by giving specific examples. Uh, like in Hindi, I saw this boy. Um, since uh, the object is animate, it gets the accusative postposition core. Whereas I saw this film, you don't need this uh, accusative postposition. And very similar patterns are found uh, in languages with accusative marking throughout the world. Actually, differential accusative marking is more common than non-differential accusative marking. So the universal is formulated here in three. If a language has an asymmetric split in object flagging, depending on some prominent scale, then the special flag is used on the prominent object. So the animate object is more prominent than inanimate. Definite is more prominent than indefinite, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> split in object flagging means uh, the, the flags of the add position or, or case marker um, is different uh, in different situations. So split and split coding and differential coding is more or less the same. By asymmetric split coding, I'm, I mean that in one situation, you get a special marker. In the other situation, there's no marker or sometimes a shorter marker. So, so what exactly is referential prominence? I just mentioned, so animate means prominent, definite means prominent. So um, I distinguish six scales of referential prominence, three scales of inherent prominence of the person scale, nominality scale and the animacy scale. So first and second is more prominent than third. Person forms are more prominent than full nominals and humans or animals more prominent than inanimates. There's also discourse prominence where definite, indefinite is one contrast or discourse given versus discourse new or background versus focus. So, so all these uh, may play a role in differential object marking and similarly, I found quite a few cases where dative alternations uh, are subject to a range of conditions. And here I give only uh, one example from Wolof and Atlantic language. So I gave the girl a bicycle as, uh, as in English, no case marking. It's really quite literal, uh, gave I the girl a bicycle but I gave a girl the bicycle is impossible. You cannot say literally give I a girl the bicycle. So when the recipient, the R argument is indefinite, you have to use the preposition C. So that's in 5C, something like Jochna Velo B Siben Kharbuchigen. So I gave the bicycle to a girl. So we have the analogous dative automation universal. If a language has an asymmetric split in recipient flagging, so case marking or at position of the recipient argument, and if this depends on some prominence scale, then the special flag is used on the non-prominent recipient. So in contrast to the object, where the special flags on the definite or animate, here it's on the indefinite or inanimate. And in the same way, just to, to remind, it, that also applies to the other scale. So we also find again and again, contrast between person form, full nominal, between given and you and so on. I don't know if all the cases are actually attested, but the prediction is that in principle, all these, uh, if they play a role, uh, would uh, have a special 
a prepositional case marker of the non-prominent recipient. So it's a sort of mirror image. English uh, exemplifies this as well. I mean, the date of alternation in many cases allows <clears throat> both options, right? I mean, in English 5b, I gave a girl the bicycle, it may sound a bit odd, and I think it's very rare to find the recipient with um, indefinite article and the uh, theme definite, but it's, I think most English speakers would say it's, it's okay. But uh, if you look at situations where the theme argument is a pronoun, it's fine for many English speakers to say, I gave him it, but I gave the boy it, I think sounds terrible to almost all English speakers. And you have to say, I gave it to the boy. So there's special marking on the non-prominent recipient. So, and recall that the full nominal is less prominent uh, than the personal pronoun thing. Okay, next is person split ergativity. Here I formulate the universal first. Uh, <clears throat> again, it's by parallel. If a language has an asymmetric split in ergative case marking, depending on some prominence scale, then the special case marker is used on the non prominent subject. So again, it's non prominent. So the ergative behaves like the recipient. And uh, I have uh, this Australian example here where we see that um, the absolutive in, or the in, intransitive clause, like we will go, we have nana with no uh, case marker on the intransitive subject. Then we will see the woman. There's again, no case marker on the person form, a argument or person form subject. But when we have the man, we'll see the woman, then there's an overt ergative marker. So the next, um, it's like the fourth pattern, the person role interactions called person case constraint. It's uh, become really uh, quite famous since uh, uh, around, uh, yeah, since about 20 years ago, I was one of the first people to write a cross linguistic paper about this. And there's really huge industry. This, I think my paper is still valid. So. French contrasts like Agnès me la présentera versus Agnès me lui présentera. You know, this is also called the me lui constraint. These are very widespread in the world's languages. So you can say Agnès will introduce her to me, but not will introduce me to her using uh, clinic pronouns. You have to say Agnès me présentera à elle. So it's an extra marker. And uh, in, in general, these things are not uh, compared to, to the English contrast with I gave the boy it versus I gave it to the boy. For some reason, I think no generative linguist has tried to unify this. So in, in my approach, these are unified uh, because as I will um, show is this, this universal uh, can be unified with the other universal. So here it really gets a bit tricky and it took me a long time to figure out the best way to formulate it. Uh, <clears throat> I think we can say that if this, the theme, the T argument is first or second, and the R, the recipient is third. So if T is higher on the person scale than R, then a language may require a longer construction, not involving person indexes like the AL in French, where short person indexes are always allowed when the R is first, second, and the T is third person. So I left this for last because, you know, if you're not familiar with these patterns, then this will not be immediately apparent. And I don't want to, uh, you know, bore you too much by explaining it in, in detail. Uh, I gave this French example because you might be familiar with uh, these French patterns, even if you're not a syntactician. And uh, it's, it's really interesting that something like 10B here, Agnès me lui présentera, is completely impossible in French. And this is a very widespread uh, cross-linguistic pattern. So these four universals, uh, two through five, can be subsumed under my first universals because they are all deviations from usual associations of row rank and referential prominence. Uh, and in all these deviations, there's longer grammatical forms if the coding is asymmetric. <clears throat> 
So I had not talked about the notion of row rank before. Uh, <clears throat> that's not really crucial, but it makes it easier to formulate the generalization. So intuitively, the A or subject outranks the P or object, the R or recipient outranks the T foreseen. Uh, <clears throat> but what's really crucial is that in language use, in text, the A and the R tend to be referentially prominent, while the P and the T tend to be non-prominent. So again and again, we find that agents and recipients are human, definite, first, second person pronoun, whereas patient and theme tends to be inanimate, indefinite, third person, uh, full nominal, and also with respect to definiteness and the other um, uh, discourse prominence features. So what we find is that in differential object marking, prominent objects get special coding. Uh, well, because objects tend to be non-prominent. In dative alternations, non-prominent recipients get special coding because recipients tend to be prominent. Split ergativity, non-prominent subjects get special coding. And in the PCC, the special coding is found when the T is prominent and the R is non-prominent. So basically the special coding is found in unusual situations when we have a deviation from the usual associations of row rank and reference prominence from, from the usual situation where A and R is prominent and P and T is non-prominent. So I, I hope this is somewhat intuitive um, <clears throat> and uh, we can generalize even further. This is my universal six. You can, you can tell that I'm a big fan of Greenberg by numbering. I always number my universals <laughs> so that I really copied from, uh, from Joseph Greenberg. So universal six, in asymmetric differential coding situations, deviations from the frequent or usual associations between conditions and meanings tend to be coded by longer grammatical forms. So another example, not from the domain of, of case marking uh, or not, not so directly, not from argument marking, a nominal possessive coding tends to be longer under the condition, the lexic condition this time, of alienable nouns. It's often short and zero, and the noun is inalienable. So in Mandarin Chinese, when the possessed noun is a kinship term, you don't need a genitive marker. You can say, wo mama from my mom. Whereas when the possessed uh, noun is not a kinship term, like house, uh, the genitive marker is really required. You have to say water funds. So we get special coding in unusual and infrequent situation. And the fact that we get that again and again can be explained by the efficiency theory of asymmetric coding. <clears throat> so unexpected me meanings get more coding and languages tend to adapt to the user's needs. So I elaborated on this in a general paper that appeared earlier this year in the Journal of Linguistics. This is a, a brief overview of my, of my theory of uh, asymmetric uh, argument coding. Uh, <clears throat> so let's get back to the uniform yardsticks versus uniform building belt. Universals one through six that I formulated they were all stated in terms of comparative concepts. These concepts are defined in the same way for all languages and they're independent of language particular rules. I would say that this allows us to test the claims objectively. There's no need to first establish the correct analyses for particular languages. On the other hand, if building block uniformity is assumed, then such objective tests are impossible because there's a lot of subjectiveness in abstract analyses. So when you read a generative paper, you will often see that authors <clears throat> adopt a framework, argue for their points, they build on assumptions. So, you know, these, these things actually are not necessarily part of science. They're part of, you know, philosophical argumentation and generative linguistics is, you know, shares a lot with philosophical argumentation, but in science, actually all you really need is, is data, methods, uh, hypotheses, theories, and ways of testing hypotheses. Um, so you don't 
in you know in other fields you don't normally adopt a framework or you don't argue you, 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 you test you try to find out whether a claim is true also you you know make as few assumptions as possible so um you know i wanted to somehow compare the two approaches but uh, you know as if i already said i'm I'm kind of biased uh, <laughs> uh, for the uniform yardstick uh, approach, but um, I'm I'm arguing now. I mean, I just said one shouldn't argue. Well, actually, I'm what I'm doing right now is doing philosophy of science, right? And in philosophy of science, I have to argue. You know, for my theory, the one that I presented in section four, you know, that I'm I'm not arguing. I'm making claims, hypotheses that can be tested objectively. Now I'm arguing. Uh, in the philosopher's mode and uh, you know just to to give you some idea of how uh, generative linguists uh, have been dealing with some of these uh, things so Anagnosto Pulu 2017 he, she argues that the PCC and the restrictions on number of objects arise in two argument against one head context so you know she has this notion of head for example then move agree functional head checking person features uh, so, you know, these X bar formalisms, all of these are these innate building blocks um, of universal grammar. And similarly, Orma Saval and Romero in 2019, they discussed just differential object marking in Spanish, but they have a similar apparatus of uh, innate uh, building blocks. Uh, uh, the reason I mentioned Anagnosto Pulu and Orma Saval and Romero here is that I uh, entered a sort of dialogue with them, with uh, Elena Anagostopoulou, actually, we we did a sort of interview that I published, an email interview that I, you can read on my blog post, and with Orma Sava and R Romero. I wanted to do an interview with them, but they didn't have time. And but still, I I was quite happy that in their 2019 paper, actually, they they criticized the functional approach, not just mine, but also functional approach of others. And I replied in in some detail. So I kind of keep trying to engage uh, with uh, generative linguistics. Okay, but um, as I said at the very beginning, I would like to uh, move beyond uh, the functionalism versus formalism. So that's why I now have measurement uh, versus building block uniformity. So for a long time, the contrast between Syntacticians working in the Greenbergian tradition and those working in the Chomsky tradition has been framed as one between functionalists and formalists. There's even a recent book by Margaret Thomas from 2020, which is called Functionalism and Formalism. So it's even until very recently, uh, this framing has been quite dominant. And there's a very recent paper that actually came out uh, 10 days ago. Well, it's on Lingbaz. Um, Jacob Boschkovich. Uh, <clears throat> tries to argue in that paper that functionalist and formalist work is more mutually compatible than is often thought. He says that generativists are not as rigidly universalist as it may appear. For example, not all languages have a DP. So since 2012, uh, Boschkovich has been trying to push this idea that while English is a DP language, uh, so Croatian, his native language, is a um, NP language. And uh, so he kind of feels a certain closeness to the typologist because he sees you know too much rash universalism uh, among his fellow Chomskyans so it's it's a kind of nice paper um, <clears throat> he also uh, argues that Greenbergians are not as rigidly particularist as it may appear um, he says these Greenbergians keep repeating the mantra that a language must be described in its own terms, but they still compare languages and thus contribute to UG from his perspective. Now, this mantra is it's kind of a bit odd. Um, I mean, I've been sort of pushing this idea and uh, um, I have been, you know, arguing that, you know, language description and language comparison are really autonomous of each other. They're kind of different um, ways of uh, looking at uh, languages. But I actually got a lot of flack uh, from other typologists. So Nicolas Himmelmann has a paper uh, where he kind of really criticized me for this. So this kind of mantra <laughs> that must refer to my 
uh, to my papers. But of course, I keep saying, of course, I compare languages. I just don't want to compare them in terms uh, of the, the descriptive rules, but in terms of comparative concepts. Uh, so it's really good to see Borskovich generatives reaching out and trying to emphasize the commonalities rather than the differences, but he doesn't talk about building block uniformity. He doesn't talk about the innateness uh, assumption and, and his NPDP parameter, where that allows a bit more diversity than the standard generativist or the, the kind of mainstream universal DP generativist, but it also assumes that NP and DP are universally available and that's innate categories. So he also has to uh, assume a lot of innateness. Um, so, so I keep asking, why can't we talk to each other? I had a paper with this title 20 years ago and my current answer is, there's really no difference in terms of ultimate goals, in terms of the diversity of languages considered, in terms of philosophical commitments, you know, Lakoff had this idea of a cognitive commitment, for example. I think that's, that's wrong. There's also no difference in terms of the range of facts considered. So, so, you know, some people say, oh, the generativists don't take into account social variation or corpus data. And then, you know, David Azure will tell you, no, no, I'm a sociolinguist. And so I think he's right there. So that, that's not the difference. The difference really is a methodological choice. Do we pursue a Darwinian vision, separating comparison and explanation? So, you know, making the choice that our methodology of comparison is separate from the ultimate um, theories, or do we pursue a Mendeleevian vision, looking for general building blocks and, you know, trying to do everything simultaneously uh, with the same uh, notion? So Mendeleev was extremely successful in this regard in chemistry, of course, building on the work of uh, uh, earlier chemists. I think both approaches are reasonable, but to me personally, the Darwinian approach offers a better hope of explaining argument coding universals and also other universals, also because of this possibility of uh, large scale cross linguistic comparison. Okay, that was it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. That was absolutely brilliant. I enjoyed this very, very much. Really, very stimulating, I thought. Uh, really, very nice. Um, just some days ago, we had a brief uh, email exchange and you asked me what the context and the purpose of this research seminar was. And I just said, well, we want to hear about exciting linguistic research and get some stimulating thoughts. And that was definitely very, very thought provoking, very stimulating. So I at least really enjoyed it very much. Um, and since I'm also uh, very much interested in these questions, the philosophy of science and linguistics and bringing together you know, functionalist and formalist ideas and sort of bridging this gap that we often find in our field. And since I am responsible for this research seminar anyway, I just take advantage of the situation and uh, start asking the first question. And um, let me see, I just have to formulate it in my head first. <laughs> but um, at the beginning, you gave us various analogies, which I all thought were very interesting. And I think the one I liked the least was the one from economics. I'm not really convinced that something like inflation can be measured with a uniform yardstick. There are, in fact, in my opinion, sort of particularities of the market when adjustments and, 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 and substitutions in this. The analogy I like the most was from biology and evolution. And, um, and um, oftentimes, so it's also one that I use a lot. And uh, I found it uh, baffling when um, uh, Chomsky and syntacticians uh, 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 try to have these parameters, like the pro drop parameters, because it's like asking, do people have, do animals have beaks or feathers or lungs or gills? And uh, even though they say these are abstract underlying concepts, they're actually quite surfacey. So a specific parameter, like the NPDP parameter, or what you mentioned, or the pro drop parameter, never really made a lot of sense to me. So yeah, I, I fully agree with, with all of this actually, but so, an explanation like natural selection evolution is much better than asking for these specific building blocks like a DP or an NP or a pro drop parameter. But when you zoom in really closely to evolution to biology, eventually you do end up with something like genes or perhaps DNA. 
So ultimately, when you zoom in really, really closely, you do find something in that area, at least, that is like a building block. So I guess my question would be, if I had to nail you down, if I really forced you to maybe give your best candidate of something that could be perhaps a building block in language, even though we want to avoid it with, and we'd rather have general mechanisms like evolution or perhaps these uh, role ranks, um, which are also very interesting. But if I had to pin you down and say, what's your best candidate for something that could perhaps be a universal building block in language, what would be your answer? Um, <clears throat> well, building block, I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm uh, definitely open to the possibility that a lot of what we find across the world's languages, a lot of the general findings are not due to efficiency, the way that I argued for argument coding, but are due to, uh, you know, something that one might call core knowledge. You know, I think uh, psychologists, you know, Elena Levin knows better about this, you know, people like Spelke or so, they, they have this notion of core knowledge so that, uh, you know, we're born with knowledge of, you know, objects, you know, maybe movement of animates, you know, or, or numbers, for example, you know, we can sort of distinguish maybe at birth between three and 10 or something like that, between few and many. So there's kind of really many <coughs> highly abstract uh, concepts that, you know, may well be uh, given to us in advance. Um, I just don't think that uh, they necess necessarily constitute the building blocks of the grammars. They might indeed uh, help us explain uh, why we don't find a much wider range of phenomena, or think of um, um, person forms like you and I. Uh, <clears throat> you know, again, I don't think uh, that you and I literally are, you know, innate as features or so. That's very speculative, but still, uh, it's you know, it's quite likely that you know, interaction. Uh, you know, in the way that we do, and not not all mammals do, right? Not all mammals interact in the same way between uh, you and I. So that that these notions as core knowledge uh, are innate, definitely. But for uh, language systems, I'm really very pessimistic. I'm pessimistic about um, you know innate distinction between level one and level two phonology, or an innate distinction between uh, a lexicon and uh, syntax, you know, or, and, uh, you know, interface restrictions or infection derivation or whatever. You know, all these have been associated with sort of architectural universals, uh, but I, I don't think any of these have good evidence for them. Right. Right. Very good answer. Right. Um, let me first see if there are questions here in the room and then we'll move it over to Zoom. So would anybody here like to ask a question? That does not seem to be the case. Um, then let's see on Zoom. Our first question comes from Delia Bentley. Delia, please unmute yourself. Um, yes, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I'm afraid I'll continue with building blocks. Um, I, um, I, I'm very sympathetic to many of your arguments and above all about, uh, you know, um, rethinking this formal functional distinction. I do wonder, however, when you talk about uh, A and S, you know, subject or P and uh, T, are those not building blocks, uh, regardless of whether they're universal, but uh, to, to, to do the comparison, do you have to compare using constructs or don't you? So I, I, what I'm saying is that, um, can we do without building blocks or uh, in, in, in linguistic comparison? Um, well, yes, of course, the comparison involves uh, a wide range of comparative concepts. Um, <clears throat> the term building block are used uh, for uh, language particular elements uh, of description. So when I describe uh, a language such as uh, Latin, uh, then I need a concept such as nominative, accusative, dative, genitive, 
I also need a concept such as ablative, for example, right? So these are the building blocks of Latin grammar in my description. Maybe somewhat different building blocks could be uh, chosen. Um, but these are the conventional ones and they work pretty well. Um, now the question is, how do these Latin building blocks relate uh, to the comparison? And what linguists has often done, have often done is take building blocks from one language and use them for comparison. And what I'm arguing is that the comparative concept, so like the A, S, and P that I used, or also called them subject and object, uh, <clears throat> that these are distinct from the descriptions. So, you know, I have argued also against Dixon uh, and in part uh, even against Balthasar Bickel. So uh, Dixon and Bickel are uh, great typologists that, you know, I've learned from immensely, uh, <clears throat> but they, they confuse these things in some of their work and Dixon confused them systematically. So he thinks that A, S and P are kind of universal building blocks of language. He doesn't say innate, but he, they're just there. And, and he thinks that all languages should be described in terms of AES and P. And, uh, and Cliff Goddard in 1982 in a great paper said, no, Australian languages cannot be described very well in terms of AES and P. But Dixon was more famous and somehow Goddard didn't get uh, through. But good Australian is like, if I know that Goddard <laughs> had a good point. <laughs> so, you know, it's, th these, these controversies come up all the time and the solution is this separating yardsticks from building blocks. Thank you. Okay, very good. The next question is by Andrea Nini. Andrea? Hi, thank you. Um, just a very quick question. So um, I know that you've done work using information theory um, so that so some of your proposals would be consistent with that. But I was wondering, more formally, would it, to what extent would it be fair to say that your universal one and six could be uh, actually special cases of uh, information theory uh, in the sense that the thing that is marked is the one that is less likely to be seen? Yes, of course. Uh... So, you know, since uh, Channel 1948, uh, you know, people have used quantitative approaches to, to measure information, to measure likelihood or surprisal. Uh, and uh, um, the idea that a robust code to transmit information uh, should uh, have particularly uh, you know, in you know, robust uh, signal for unlikely uh, messages. That that idea has been around for a long time, and there's and there's uh, quite quite a bit of more formal mathematical work applying information theory uh, to grammatical coding. And uh, I, you know, I'm kind of mathematically challenged, so I don't uh, pursue that. Uh, myself, uh, I see my role rather as sort of bridging the work that comes uh, from language description, including generative grammar. There's a lot of generative work that has inspired me a lot, like this work on the person case constraint, for example, and trying to, to formulate it in such a way that people who work with mathematical information theory can, can make a link then. All right, that makes sense. Uh, the next raised hand I saw um, comes from Ivo Ivanov. Uh, Ivo. Um, do you see any hope that your universals may be integrated into a learnability theory? Because after all, that was the key motivation for the whole generative enterprise to state a state that a speaker might have at the beginning of language learning uh, that allows the speaker to perform the language that later, well, uh, uh, the speaker is able to perform. I was thinking about a very concrete example, your role rank universal. Might that be formulated in a way that a speaker, uh, that we could say, okay, that's a learnable universal? It, because after all, if it's not innate, 
And if we want to want to try to bypass innateness by using core knowledge or stuff like that, which Chomsky wouldn't really really endorse, how would how would we reformulate a universal so that it may become learnable? Because they are learnable after all. Well, I would say what's learnable is language particular systems. So the Hindi system of object marking is learnable and uh, a learnability theory has to explain that it's learnable. And it seems to me that what uh, Chomsky and others have been worried by is not the kind of argument coding splits that I was talking about. Um, so what I'm interested in is why don't we find the sort of Hindi prime why don't we find a language which is like Hindi, except that the object marking is only found on the um, indefinite and inanimate objects, but not on definite and animate objects, right? Such a language is not found, and I find that interesting. I want to explain that. Now, uh, is, would such a language be unlearnable? I don't think so. I think such a language would be really easy to learn. Um, so, so, you know, I think it's really a matter of adaptation. So, so I, would, I would say what Chomsky is after is trying to find the ultimate limits of what is an attainable uh, language. It's a little bit like in biology, as if you ask the question, what kinds of organisms can you make out of DNA? Mm. There's a huge uh, variety of organisms you can make. Would they survive? Well, well, of course, the vast majority of them would die immediately. Uh, and uh, a sort of a Hindi prime language, if you created it as an artificial language, if you, uh, you know, if you made a nice Hollywood movie out of it where a cool group of people speak in that language, then you would, after a while, have a community of speakers who, who learn this artificial language and practice it and so on. But if this community sort of continues, without prescriptivism to speak this language. And the prediction is, you know, within a very short time, it would <laughs> revert to better object marking. I mean, there's actually artificial language learning experiments showing that, that this is the case. So, um, so I don't think that acquisition uh, and, and this sort of coding efficiency view that they have very much uh, of an interface. They are kind of orthogonal issues. All right, very interesting answer. Um, one more question by Eva, Eva schulz band Eva, please. Actually, Elena had her hand, her actual hand up before me. Is that right, Elena? <laughs> yes, but go ahead. I can always come in after you. You go ahead. Okay, well, the trouble is I may be coming in out of the left field. Um, so I was wondering what Martin thought about, in terms of his building blocks, of something much more interactional, and if you like, in, in, in the way we think in developmental psychology, about the sort of what language does for you. So I seem to remember talking about, I think maybe Bill Croft used to talk about reference and predication. This is what I'm talking about, and this is what I want to say about it. And in development, in language development, that's what you see kids doing. They start to point a name and then they learn to add more information. The problem is, even if one thought those were the kinds of interactive building blocks to begin with, you'd still have this problem of what you'd end up measuring, I think. Um, because, uh, I mean, there is a limit, as I think Martin was showing in some of his examples, to what you, to the, to the, um, to the mechanics of reference and the mechanics of predication and I, I think there, were, there are some universals around there but would it be helpful to start from building blocks at that level of interaction or abstraction it's both uh, and would it actually help you then get the right level of measurement? Um, yes of course um, so you know for, com for comparison the, ki the kinds of yardsticks I use for comparison, uh, you know, should be ones that give us insight. And uh, to the extent that, um, you know, ordinary human interaction is cr really crucial for 
you know, the makeup of grammars, you know, I mentioned the you versus I, you know, exactly. you mentioned the reference versus predication versus modification. So these are really, really absolutely basic uh, um, notions, concepts that, that we really need to, uh, <laughs> to even begin to interact and talk about things. Um, so these things are kind of there. And then the question is, how do they relate to grammar? And I try to uh, use this notion of building blocks for the things that we have in grammar. So, um, you know, building blocks, of course, a very sort of vague and general word, and you can you can extend it. But um, you know, let's let's just talk uh, uh, about um, reference and modification and speaker and hearer uh, in terms of sort of fundamental notions. And then the question is how the building blocks of particular grammars relate to those fundamental notions. And, and I don't quite know, but what I'm trying to do is to find out to what extent the grammatical systems of languages around the world are similar mm -hmm. and how I can uh, capture the similarities. And uh, the generativists keep proposing that the similarities are best captured with abstract concepts that are at the same time also concepts for describing languages. So they, they, the language particular building blocks are also thought to be innate building blocks. And, and I'm saying no, uh, these fundamental notions, maybe innate core knowledge or so, are not directly related to grammar. Grammars, grammatical systems are made of language particular building blocks, like the Latin ablative that I mentioned, right? It's a really weird thing. No other language has, a, has an ablative. You know, it has this kind of instrumental uh, meaning, you know, modal meaning occurs with certain prepositions and so on. You know, all languages have really idiosyncratic stuff like that. Um, and in order to learn languages, we have to learn this idiosyncratic stuff. We have to construct these really uh, specific uh, building blocks and uh, which and cuts can, across the different levels. That's the other thing I got from your talk. Yeah. I mean, if you talk about something like reference, it's happening phonetically, uh, semantically, linguistic. I mean, all the way up and down. So trying to divide these levels as if they had nothing to do with each other, it's not going to get you anywhere. Yeah, it's you know, people have tried to explain uh, the the limits on what we find in languages in terms of. Uh, compartmentalizing grammars in terms of saying, okay, here's phonology level one, level two, here's morphology, here's lexicon, here's uh, syntax, here's deep structure, here's surface structure, and so on. And, and those ideas have been interesting and have uh, led to a lot of new probing, but they have not led to any robust findings. Uh, whereas I think, for example, the efficiency theory of grammatical coding, the ideas have been around for over a hundred years and they've been confirmed again and again. Uh, so, so this is not a new idea at all. And what I'm doing uh, is not innovative. So, you know, I, I, I couldn't get a research grant. I'm, I'm just trying to, to figure out which of the ideas of the past uh, are robust, uh, which of them should we keep. Right. Okay, uh, sorry, Elena, I didn't see your hand raised, um, but now it's time for um, Eva's question. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering about the status of um, prominence. Is that a con comparative concept? How is it used to measure or, well, to compare languages and can we maybe do without it just by talking about say, expectedness of um, particular persons, which I guess can be regarded as comparative concepts, particular animacy categories in particular roles. Yes, we can do without prominence and we can do without role rank. So we could state these universals each in a particular way. So we could say we just talk about uh, <clears throat> agent patient on the one hand and first versus third person or just about recipient and theme indefinite versus indefinite and so on so these generalizations uh, that there's these six prominence scales that's just for convenience 
and for inspiration for possible further um, speculation about why these generalizations hold. But really the, <laughs> the explanation for why indefinite objects tend not to have accusatives and definites tend to have accusatives is that definite objects are rare and unexpected. That's why speakers tend to put accusative markers on them. Speakers don't need any notion, any general notion of prominence. So the notion of prominence and the notion of row rent uh, just help me to uh, formulate the generalizations in a maximally general way so as to please uh, the scientists who likes abstractness and beauty, <laughs> but it's, it's not a crucial element of the explanatory story. Okay, I'm glad to hear that. But I mean, definiteness is a good example because it may be the case that, for example, definiteness doesn't govern the coding of agents to the same extent that it, well, is responsible or um, governs the coding of objects cross-linguistically speaking. Well, yes, okay, with, with agents and patients, um, there, there is an sort of interesting asymmetry that I didn't talk about, but that you keep thinking about because in the Australian languages, it's sort of very, uh, very salient that <coughs> there is this asymmetry and, and, and I don't know, but I, ha I have discussed uh, this asymmetry and I think still, despite, this slight asymmetry, the uh, maximal generality of the universal is still possible. And I find that quite amazing. So I, I don't know why we don't always, why, 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 you know, these six prominence scales that I mentioned don't always behave in the same way. So I don't know, but, but there is no counterexamples. There's no sort of anti-prominence tendency or so. The prominence tendencies uh, typically work in the same way, but why is it that definiteness and animacy seem to work in exactly the same way with objects, but not in exactly the same way with subjects and with recipients and themes, we simply don't know yet because we haven't looked at the data enough because recipients and themes are not so frequent. But all the data that I've seen also for recipients and themes are compatible with the claims that I made so far. And, uh, and, you know, I hope that others will kind of join the effort and look at more languages and um, maybe do more studies using artificial language learning or whatever. So um, then I would just like to thank you again. I'm really grateful you could do this. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> I know you're, you're very busy. This was a wonderful talk, very rich and interesting. I'm sure everybody enjoyed it. And in this last, in the same email exchange uh, from a few days ago, I said another purpose was, of course, to socialize, hang out and have fun. And unfortunately, this is really something we can't do via Zoom. Would have been great to take you to a restaurant and a pub. And I guess that just means uh, you have to come to us uh, some other day, some other time. And uh, it would be great to meet you again. So thank you once again. It was wonderful. And I hope to see you someday. Thank you to everyone in Manchester. Bye-bye.